The title of this presentation is Money Markets Manifestos, which is obviously going to have a big, big impact on our market, not just next year, but for the foreseeable future, the next probably five years. Um, just going to touch on five areas here, so I'll look at global trends first and how that dovetails into European capital flows. Look at the different sectoral differences and the outlook for the mid commercial sectors for next year. Then we'll touch on you know what's happening with elections manifestos, not just the UK, but broadly or more broadly across Europe and what that means for key factors driving real estate markets next year and beyond. Okay, so if we start with the global level, um, I picked this chart up on the left yesterday. That I did have a bit of time to read my emails. I'll try and describe what it shows. It's it's basically um, looking at asset prices generally, equities, bonds, and house prices for major advanced markets. And it shows the cycle of the value of these um, markets relative to the you know, economic base, if that makes sense. So at the minute, we're looking at the part in the yellow. We had the drop off from GFC, and we're gradually seeing a rise in asset prices, possibly above where the kind of the, the main economy is at, which suggests that you know. We're hitting a peak, it's starting to flatten off, and how long have we got left for equity prices generally? I then tried to look at that for real estate markets, so global investment real estate volumes, which is the chart on the right. So I've indexed this rather than showing it in terms of the, the amount that's been invested. And I've also looked at volumes relative to the number of transactions. So the, the volumes is the, the pale blue line, the number of deals is the dark blue line. So what we can see is as of 2014, we got back above peak in terms of the <coughs> number of deals that are being done and the total volumes that are being transacted. But since then, the number of deals is pretty much, you know, it's ebbed and flowed, but it's <coughs> at a similar level. Whereas volumes driven by higher values has actually moved out a little bit. <coughs> is that divorced from the, the real economy as it were? Well, the red line shows global GDP growth, which is remarkably straight line, but actually, it's quite interesting if you index it, it looks like we're at around about the same level to the real economy. So are asset prices for real estate getting beyond where the economy is? Possibly not, it's a moot point, but it's open for discussion. But I think what we will see, you know, this forecasts are always straight line. I'm not sure whether we're gonna see the same level of GDP increasing globally based on what's happening in the world, particularly with US and China and the trade disputes. And that's clearly going to have an impact on certain tech stock, particularly the US top stock, given the decision by China recently to uh, curtail the amount that they'll spend on that. If we look at the global regions within the globe, the chart on the left shows, again, economic growth year on year. Yeah, so it's the amount that's added to the economy in each global region. So what you can see is the Asia Pac region has been significantly outgrowing the Americas and Europe or EMEA. So then if you look at global investment into the three regions, there is a bit of a correlation here. So there's a lot of cyclicality in the curves for whether it's Asia Pac, the Americas or EMEA, but it does pretty much translate to what's happening in the real economy. So it's no surprise that Asia Pac as a market is seeing more investment activity than EMEA or the Americas. I mean, what's interesting is when you get below those numbers is to what extent is driving Asia back, and it's an awful lot of developments. It's an awful lot of money into China, and China now invests more than any other nation globally. Have invested in the last 12 months about 536 billion, compared to about 510 in the US. But only but 98 percent of that Chinese money went into China. 13 percent of US money went globally. So that's a pretty big difference, and that is linked to this dip in the curve when Chinese capital controls came in and the money started going back into the country and the region. So what do things look like for EMEA going forward if it is tailing off a little bit and is it the weakest kind of global region for investment? Whilst it doesn't have the same economic growth fundamentals or even population dynamics, there's one advantage that Europe does have which is yields relative to these other global markets. So this shows the difference in yield that you can get in Europe on average compared to these other domiciles. So for investors in China, Hong Kong, Singapore, you can get a higher yield in Europe than you can in those locations. South Africa, you can't. The US, you can't. Germany is in Europe, so there's no actual difference. But then if you factor in hedging, or the hedging gain that you can get by investing in Europe, 
or into the euro into euros, that is much more positive. So the gain that you can get is positive for all of these other, other domiciles buying into euro denominated assets. <coughs> if you blend the two together, which is the bar across the top, it means that buying into Europe, you get a better return than you would back home. So that's why a huge amount of cross-border capital comes into Europe. So Europe per se is about 50% cross-border, the US is about 20% and Asia is about 30%. So Europe is by far the most diversified market for cross-border capital coming in. And this is one of the reasons why. Now, what's interesting is no, not all of the Europe's big markets have been performing as well as they could. Post-Brexit, you can see how much the UK has dropped off in terms of investment volumes. It's about 50% now on rolling terms. It'll probably about, be about 40% off by the end of the year. Year on year, about 30% off. Germany and France are doing sort of pretty well. France has picked up. And there's lots of other tier two countries that have picked up the slack since the UK has dropped off, such as Sweden, Netherlands, Poland, Spain. <coughs> if you look at cities, this chart gives an indication of investment momentum in the last year relative to the last five years. So the total amount of, best of investment is the horizontal axis. So we can still see that London is still the biggest market, it's the dominant market in Europe, followed by Paris, and then you've got Madrid, Frankfurt, Berlin, Stockholm, Amsterdam. But then the relativity shows you know, if the last year's investment activity is less the same as or greater than the five-year average. So anywhere in blue is above, anywhere in red is down. So some of the German markets are actually in here, and actually all of the UK big markets are in, in the red part, which is what you'd expect. There's still quite a few in yellow, and the ones that are blue tends to be sort of second tier cities in Germany, or it's the likes of Madrid, Lisbon, uh, Helsinki, Warsaw. So sort of outer frontier, tier two markets, which have had a late economic play or a slightly different play to drive activity into those markets. But those markets are essentially a bit smaller than the rest, and it does show that in terms of investment terms, we are starting to peak across Europe. But the other thing that's interesting is you know, where yields are at. This one's a bit colourful, it's a bit jazzy. But um, if we stick to the, to the red diamond at the bottom, that represents where we think double net yields are. So that is the yield less purchase costs from a transaction, plus any non-recoverables from income. So it's different to what is a gross uh, initial or a net initial yield as they're quoted. But you can see you know, down at the bottom you've got all the German markets, so just over 2%, 2.5%. Double net yield, which is pretty tight. You move into the middle, you've got Copenhagen, <coughs> Stockholm, and then you move further along, you've got the London markets and the other UK regional cities, and then you move out to the more provincial markets, you have to smaller markets in Poland. So, this, by any stretch of the imagination, is the markets on the left don't look like they've got an awful lot of yield compression left in them, despite negative interest rates. I mean, that's a moot point, but I don't think we'll see negative interest rates forever, that's for sure. Low interest rates yet. But there is still a bit of a margin there. But the UK looks completely mispriced in terms of where it's at relative to all of the markets in terms of the, the double net yield. The markets to the right, you know, there's arguably some yield compression in there, but for a lot of these markets, they're priced like that for a reason. It's because they've got low liquidity, smaller, higher risk, so they'll probably stay like that. So maybe a little bit of yield compression left, particularly for the UK, maybe not so much anywhere else. So that's going to drive some investment continually into the market. If you look at the Occupy market side, again, another matrix, trying to explain this one. The horizontal is vacancy rates, so this is for offices. So the further to the right you get, you get much higher vacancy rates in markets. To the left, you get low vacancy rates. So the cross dashes here represent you know, the quadrants of where markets are. Anybody in the top left is low vacancy, the vertical axis represents <coughs> absorption relative to availability. So if you translate that from a percentage to number of years, anything above 20% is about four years worth of supply relative to current levels of absorption, which is perfectly fine. Anything below that is getting a bit weaker. So the ones above the 20% line suggest there should be rental growth in those markets, or at least landlord favorable conditions. And all the red dots point to landlord favorable conditions. Blue is neutral, yellow is tenant. So there is a logic to the way markets work, but you do get some anomalies like Milan, which is a landlord market, yet has high vacancy and relatively low levels of absorption to availability. 
but arguably, you know, there's a dominance of landlord-friendly markets. We expect that to continue in the year ahead, which should drive rental growth, certainly in the red. Logistics market, again, this functions differently as much as by city, it's the regions that it more broadly supports. But again, there's a dominance of red as opposed to <coughs> blue, which is neutral, or yellow, which is tenant-friendly markets. So again, supply-demand conditions are pretty tight. There is more spec development coming on but it's still dominated by landlord-friendly markets. And that, again, will continue in the year ahead. So if you look at how that's impacting rents or rental growth, chart on the left shows rental indices. Um, white is office, blue is logistics, uh, yellow is traditional shopping centers. So it's taken a while for rents to come back from the previous peak. It took until about 2016, 2017 for those two sectors. Shopping center rents actually came back earlier. The shopping centre rents across Europe are now plateaued and will probably start dropping off, certainly in this country. For offices and logistics, I still think we've got another year of rental growth in the year ahead. For some markets, probably longer. But what's also interesting is if you look at that relative to the impact on value growth, so this is the capital value index, that's gone up by about 10%, so all sectors have gone up by about 50% of the values. So it's clear where the value drivers come from, and that's from yield compression. So if we've got less yield compression to come and not so much rental growth, we've just got to anticipate that we're going to get lower returns from standing assets. And I think that is now much more factored into how fund managers assess markets and the, the way they're looking at it. Um, what about retail though? Is it an opportunity? <coughs> I think for certain parts of retail it definitely is. I think anybody owning UK retail or shopping centres might disagree at the minute, but for others looking at it from the outside they probably wouldn't. I'll try to explain this one quite simply. The pie chart on the left shows the distribution of space, retail space across Europe. So 20% of space is in traditional shopping centers, only around about 1.5% retail parks, warehouses, 24% grocery, 52% everything else, which is your high street, etc. But if you look at where retail spend happens, so that's on actual goods rather than services, only 11% happens in shopping centers, only 37% happens in the high street and everything else. Now, online is part of that, so that's taken about 9% out of the market. But 8% of spending is in retail parks and warehouses, 35% grocery stores. <coughs> that's more than the amount of space that there is. So the greens represent an opportunity for growth, to me, I think, generally. Whereas the ones in yellow are going to require some pretty careful management to make them work. And it's not just about goods anymore, obviously, it's about services. Is online retail still having an impact? Um, well, yes it is, but we've said for a couple of years now, I do think that is plateauing and dropping off the impact of online retail on, on retail spending per se. What the charts on the left show is um, changes in seasonality of spending. So this shows the extent to which sales have gone up in November across different countries and how that's changed from 2015 to actually, there's one mistake, make one mistake. The bottom one is, should be 2018. <coughs> so the one at the top shows that in November, you know, this whole Black Friday phenomenon, et cetera, in terms of bringing spending forward, only four markets saw more sales in November than the previous month. As of 2018, there's now 12 markets that see more spending in November compared to it happening in December. But not everywhere does. <coughs> the ones that see a drop in November, there are still eight countries there, including France, who, as you've probably seen in the press, want to completely ban. Amazon and Black Friday, they're completely against it. Um, so there are, the, the rate of change from e-commerce is completely different culturally and across market, but it is having an impact. The other side of it is the extent to which Omnichannel is now driving retail sales per se, not just retail generally, but it's taking an increasing share of online retail sales, particularly in fashion. And that's because retailers are recognizing the power of the store and actually driving online sales, not just sales into the store itself. And that's all about click and collect. So Omnichannel and online with click and collect is expected to grow much beyond just online per se. So if you look at online retailers' profitability, compared to omnichannel, it's significantly lower. You know, it's one, two percent compared to seven or eight percent. So there's a, a business reason why they're doing it. So retail is not dead, um, it just needs work. The servicing part, you know, there's been a lot of spend in F&B, food and beverage spending, on recreation. 
pretty big differences again across Europe. Spain certainly like to spend the most when it comes to going and eating out, and the Romanians less so. But interestingly, if you look at the growth rates in F&B Spain per market, you see a higher level of growth in Central and Eastern Europe where there's lower levels of discretionary spending. So they are trying to play catch up, and this is driving a lot of demand for alternative experience, retail, leisure, and the likes within shopping centers. And it's very valid why a lot of shopping centers owners and asset managers are changing their mix because they need to. Um, tourism <coughs> is also a big part of what's been driving markets. The black bar is, or the black element is Europe. So the growth in tourism in Europe is just phenomenal over the last 50, 60 years. And that is continuing to drive experience retail. So it's how you tap into that. And it's also understandable why there's been a lot of growth in hotel investment um, across Europe in the last two, three years. You know, it's, it's gone through a boom time. I think the UK market said it's they had the best year in hotels this last year, and they could have done significantly better. Um, and that, of course, ties into the whole mixed use thing and how mixed use can really work and how that can really work for investors. So you might be wondering why I've got some biscuits on this one. This is the Garibaldi Fund. That's my joke for the day. Um, but their returns over the last year, according to MCI, has tripled the benchmark for Italy. And that's about investing into this um, scheme in Milan, Porto Nova scheme, which is a really, really well thought out, well designed, well -designed scheme. And it shows that investing into mixed use on a large scale, tying it into infrastructure and transport can really work and drive higher returns. And of course, there's lots of different cities that are building their infrastructure, building their transport networks to drive these opportunities. Paris is probably one of the, at the forefront of this, expanding its um, metro lines and transport infrastructure. And it's also resulting in a shift of occupiers from the city core into the, burbs, the suburbs and the fringes. Yeah, so we're getting a more polycentric model to cities rather than completely centric, which is something we've arguably seen in London post-Olympics with the growth of the different fringes and growth around major transport nodes. And that's definitely a future for a lot more investment going forward. And it also ties into other things. Okay, so back to the point, uh, it is panto season for anybody who's familiar with that. And uh, to Boris, yes, Jeremy is behind you. He's, uh, he's about 10 points behind you, um, according to the polls at the weekend. And yesterday, today, I don't think yesterday's debate on the BBC will do anything to sway any voters in any way, shape or form. I think most votes are probably cast so at the minute, it looks odds on for a Tory majority at the weekend. Um, so what does that mean? It, it may not be. I think the UK referendum, the odds on, odds on with a, a remain and it went the other way. But I, I think this time, we are looking definitely at a UK majority for the Conservative Party. I think at worst, it will be a hung parliament. But I think the odds of that are diminishing. This one's a bit busy. This is some of the uh, Conservative <laughs> manifesto pledges. The main thing was clearly about getting Brexit done, and that's what's brought a lot of voters in, just to bring about that certainty, whether you agree with it or not, to the UK. I think some of the other parts on the left are things that will impact the real estate market. Cutting emissions by 2050 is one of those, um, putting money into infrastructure, even though they haven't made any real massive pledges. They've just been very safe in what they pledged they will do, and they haven't over promised, or promised things that are not realistic, as have some of the other parties. I'm not sure whether we won't see an increase in income tax or other things because the, the money's got to come from somewhere. In Europe, we brought it out again, a bit of a changing of the guard here. Uh, Ms. Lagarde and von der Leyen have taken over the ECB and EC, as it were. And I think we will see, see some differences in terms of ECB policy, whilst there's still 20 billion going into month per month in uh, buying up bonds. She's clearly stated that she wants to put a shift <coughs> fiscal policy, more spending. And equally, you know, after the elections in May, there's been a shift in terms of the, the, sort of the, the, the members of parliament in Europe, more Greens, more Liberals, and she has also clearly stated that she wants to spend more money on environmentally friendly investments in infrastructure and social infrastructure. So I think we'll see a change. I don't think we'll see all MEPs or all European states agreeing with that. Um, but I do think we'll gradually see a greater shift. And as the UK does leave, I think there's a likelihood that there'll be closer political union across Europe. What does the forecast look like for next year? Well, the number of bright spots at the end of this year relative to the start of this year are fewer. Um, so anything with the green sunshine is you know, three to four and a half percent economic growth. Anything that's yellow with a bit of rain is sub one percent. 
So Germany and Italy are in that camp. I think the UK is currently 1 to 2%, I think, after the um, election, if it is a conservative majority, and there is more clarity, I think the UK GDP forecast will start to expand. Obviously, there has to be uh, discussions around the budget and whether they will deliver Brexit next year or not, but I think there will be a, an upside to that. But generally, we're looking at pretty low economic growth for next year, on average around about 1.2%. Not spectacular. But there is a reason for that as well, and it comes back to people and labour markets. The chart on the left shows population change since 2004. <coughs> it's a post-EU accession of all the major economies. So anything that is dark green represents population growth of 10% plus. Anything that is dark orange, population declines of minus 10%. And then very variances between that. But if you look at it, if you can look at it closely, it's a bit small. You know, I mean, Russia's just been hollowed out, parts of East Germany, parts of Central and Eastern Europe, apart from around some of the big cities. And that's also a reflection of you know, how um, employment markets are changing. So on average this year, we expect employment growth, or Oxford Economics does, to grow by just under 1% across the EU. But significant differences. Spain and Ireland, much higher. Spain's coming up with a much higher level of unemployment base. Ireland, if you look on the map, has seen massive population growth. So it can drive that working population forward. Whereas for some of the countries on the left, including Romania and Poland, there are now less people employed in those countries than there were a year ago. So more people are migrating or retiring than they are entering the workforce. And that ties into the whole declining work, working population issue that we have in Europe, and it's now starting to become very real. So this is the growth rate for this year. I think you probably halve that for next year. So it shows that employment growth is declining. And for the last cycle, for many cycles, our economic growth has been driven by employment growth, and that is going to have to change going forwards. So we've got to be a lot more productive. You know, our productivity levels across advanced economies has sometimes declined. It certainly hasn't risen. Excuse me. We've got to look at how technology can drive that. Technology and real estate. There's a lot of ESG investment, which is about fuel power infrastructure. For us, it's about adopting modern construction methods. If there is a lower labour force to do more manual work, we've got to be smart in terms of how we build things. Um, and there's lots of other issues that are really going to drive how markets work, how governments support it or not, and what the opportunities will be. I certainly won't go into all of these in detail. But we're looking at quite a lot of change for next year. I think this cycle has pretty much ended. <coughs> so next year it will definitely end. And then I think we shift to a new era, a new regime. You know, I think there's 30 trillion set aside for ESG investment globally which is significantly higher than the 1.73 trillion invested in real estate globally. So investors are clearly backing that. You know, governments and policy makers are backing that. And it's how we embed that into real estate going forward. And that's it for me. Great. Happy Christmas. Yeah.